American Studies. And one thing I'm involved on with on campus is uh, the Glee Club, which is kind of like choir. Yeah. Awesome. Where did you say that you were from again, Caroline? I didn't hear you. Oh, I'm from a small town in Delaware. Yeah. Okay, so you're both Northeast. Okay. All right, cool. Um, I do also want to point out that we have a, essentially a fourth member um, joining us today, um, Christopher, or Topher as he goes by. Um, he'll be serving sort of in the background. Um, I want to point out that we do have a Q&A feature, so you can actually ask us questions live throughout the session. Um, we're going to leave that until the end, and I'll try to um, pick those questions that I think um, are a little bit more broad and can serve everyone um, as useful. Um, and I'll try to leave as much time as I can at the end for that. And so I think that's all of the logistical stuff that I needed to get out of the way. So with that, we can get just about started, I think. Um, and here, if you um, came into the Zoom early, you might have already read the statement um, at the bottom of this. And I think it's just as important to acknowledge, um, you know, the history of our institution as much as it is to emphasize what makes it so great today. Um, so I won't read it verbatim, but it is really interesting to get to know the um, history of Dartmouth because I do think it is a little bit unique, um, even in the context of the Ivy League. So um, you may know by now that Dartmouth was founded in 1769. Um, which would make it actually the ninth oldest institution of higher learning, I think, in the United States, um, on, along the banks of the Connecticut River. Um, and it sits on unceded Abenaki land. So Dartmouth did not necessarily do the best job at um, fulfilling its, the mission that it was chartered for, which was um, essentially educating the Native American population of the, the greater region. Um, and it wasn't until around 1970 um, that the college really recommitted to uh, fulfilling that chartered mission. And for the last 50 years, it has been something that we really keep in mind. Um, and fast forward to today, we have 200 ind indigenous students um, representing more than 70 different tribal nations and communities. So just something fun and relevant to know about Dartmouth. But as for um, more modern history, um, I like to start off by sort of orienting ourselves um, with where we are. Um, if you're from the South, like I am, New England geography is super confusing. So here's a handy little map up here in the right-hand corner to give you an idea of where we are. This is us, by the way. <laughs> so we're located in Hanover, New Hampshire, sort of at the... Um, a borderland between Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, from where I'm sitting right now, which is like quite literally on campus, I could walk maybe 13, 14 minutes down the road and I would technically be in Vermont. So this whole sort of area um, at the borderland is called the Upper Valley. So if you hear us reference that term, um, just know that that means sort of this hub of activity around the college that extends into Vermont as well. Um, and you can see that we're about two hours north of Boston, um, about four hours north of New York City, and about three hours south of Montreal. I would say that those are probably time estimates with very light traffic because I've definitely had it happen sometimes that it takes like four minutes, four hours to get from Boston to Hanover. So it definitely depends on the time of year and the traffic, but this is where we are in relation um, to surrounding cities. And this is a nice aerial shot of Dartmouth, um, clearly not in the winter. Um, so you can see sort of the iconic green right here. Um, we are very clearly a school that is situated in the woods, um, trees pretty much as far as the eye can see. And you can sort of see that the town of Hanover is very much built around campus. So I'll point right here, this is like, downtown Hanover, which looks super, super small on this aerial shot, but I promise you there's a lot more there than you would ever really expect. Um, it's kind of a running joke among Dartmouth students to say that Hanover or Dartmouth is like surprisingly cosmopolitan, but, you know, I would kind of agree with that. Um, the sort of selection of restaurants, even though we've had some clothes for COVID, 
um, is pretty impressive for a small college town. Um, Hanover's population is only a little above 10,000, I think, so it's a pretty small town. Um, but we have modern luxuries, such as a 24-hour CVS, um, and some neat things that you might not know about this area. Um, we have the largest hospital, tertiary hospital, north of Boston and south of Montreal. Um, and our Hood Museum, which is right here, um, is one of the largest collections in New England. So we're definitely out there in the woods, but um, it's sort of like urban woods. Even from where I am right now in my apartment, I can hear so much traffic on a daily basis. So it doesn't always feel you know, like you're super isolated, like you might think if you've never visited campus. Um, and this is a shot from the Connecticut River, which is like literally a 13 minute walk down the street. And, you know, usually in pictures, things look better than they do in real life. But this does like not even do justice to the Connecticut River. It is absolutely stunning. Um, at any time of year, but especially, I think, during the summer and the spring. So this is what you would see if you walked um, just a little bit west of campus. And I want to take this opportunity to loop in um, Nicole and Caroline. It sounds like you're both from the Northeast, but different parts of the Northeast. And um, I'm sure that you had your own adjustments as well. You know, different um, states are very different from New Hampshire and certainly from where we are here in the woods. So if you want to talk a little bit about what your experience was um, sort of coming to Hanover, New Hampshire, from where it is that you're from, talk a little bit about um, your experience adjusting to it. We'll start with you, Nicole. Sure, yeah. So I come from kind of a, suburb, a suburban kind of area, um, and yeah, coming to Dermot was an adjustment because it was so rural, and I initially thought I wanted to go to a city and all that, but as soon as I visited Dartmouth, I kind of fell in love with the pastoral quality of it um, and the, the nature. I mean, it is really beautiful. I'm sure you'll hear people say that over and over again, um, and for me, it was a really easy adjustment once you kind of get there. Um, there's lots to do in Hanover, and there's lots to do on campus, so it kind of becomes... Um, becomes normal for you once you're there. How about you, Caroline? Did you have a different experience at all? I think I, so I guess maybe Delaware is technically the Northeast, but it gets cold there in the winter, but there's cold and there's cold. So I guess that the winter was maybe a bit more of an adjustment for me than people who come from New England proper. Um, but I think that there's a misconception that the winter sort of closes doors or that people have to stay inside. I felt like the winter really opened up opportunities for me. I learned to ski and there was so much sledding and skating and just the breathtaking beauty of the winter was really a surprise to me, a pleasant surprise. So I think winter is my favorite season in Hanover. Winter is indeed quite beautiful. I will say, I will insert myself at this one point. Um, this is my first year in Hanover and I'm from the tropics, like literally the southern point of Texas. And it is definitely an adjustment, but I can confirm that winter is very much a beautiful season, um, possibly more beautiful than even like the warm seasons. Um, and you're totally right that, you know, things don't just like shut down like you might imagine. Um, you really do get used to the cold. Um, I would say for those of you who are coming from warmer climates like me, you probably want to get like really good snowshoes and a, a heavy coat, um, but you would be very surprised at how far a good coat takes you. So it's really not that scary, I promise. <laughs> um, and another sort of um, interesting point to Dartmouth is, you know, we're not just situated in nature and like staring at it all day, staring at it all day. Um, yes, it is beautiful, but we also do try to use the, our surroundings as much as we possibly can. And some of the ways that we might take advantage of that, as you see here, um, Hanover is not exactly, um, it doesn't really have like skyscrapers or nightlife. So there's not really much in the way of like light pollution. So, I mean, literally on a cloudless night, um, you could go out and you could actually see the stars with the naked eye, which is a really great sight. Um, but if you're someone who's really into like astronomy, 
um, studying the stars in the woods at the Static Observatory is something that you could do. Um, something else is the organic farm, which is really, really cool. Um, it's a little bit ways off campus. It is still pretty close by though. Um, and maybe you're studying like sustainable farming practices here or bee colony collapse disorder. I will also note that um, I think it's a very important point that a good portion of the food that students eat in the dining hall does actually come from the organic farm. And I can confirm that the food is profoundly fresh and actually pretty good at Dartmouth. And I feel like not enough students ask about that. Um, so I do think that's just a fun little thing to note that, you know, if eating like locally and fresh is important to you, um, Dartmouth is a really great place for that. Another thing that is not really related to the trees and mountains that surround us, um, Dartmouth and New Hampshire in general is, I think, a lot more politically um, active than you might imagine, especially during um, an election cycle like we are in right now. So you might know if you follow politics that the New Hampshire primary is a pretty big thing. Um, and because of that, we had pretty much every major candidate and I think like, almost every minor candidate that I can think of came through New Hampshire, um, even came to Dartmouth and like spoke here. I know many of my coworkers got their Warren selfies. So it is a really exciting place to be, um, especially during an election cycle. And the guy you see here, um, his name is Garrett Muscatel. He just graduated actually, but um, he served two years, his junior year and his senior year, um, actually as a Democratic member of the New Hampshire State House of Representatives, um, which is really impressive. And that just really goes to show you how far you can actually take politics here in the woods. Um, not that everyone who comes to Dartmouth will do that, but that just goes to show you um, you know, just how much you can do here, um, where you wouldn't expect it. Um, and I think another thing to highlight is, you know, you might know that Dartmouth College calls itself Dartmouth College, not Dartmouth University, even though people call us Dartmouth University sometimes, and it's a little bit annoying. Um, but we call ourselves Dartmouth College very intentionally. Um, when we call ourselves Dartmouth College, we are kind of lying to you because Dartmouth is technically a university. We do have some graduate schools. We have a medical school. We have a business school, for example. Um, but Dartmouth College continues to call itself Dartmouth College very much intentionally um, because we want to put the emphasis on the undergraduate experience. Uh, Dartmouth is the smallest Ivy League school by a pretty good margin. Um, and we keep it that way because, you know, we want to have those close faculty student relations and also to give an opportunity for students to really get to know each other. Um, I know every time that I'm walking across campus with a Dartmouth student, I feel like they say hi and stop to talk to like 10 different people, which is a little bit annoying, <laughs> but um, it just really goes to show you how close knit um, the group is here at Dartmouth because of its small size. And in terms of what the um, education looks like in that liberal arts college model, um, we have what are called distributive requirements. So it's kind of something in between like a core and a completely open curriculum. So we do give you some structure, but it's not so much structure that you have to take like one specific class. Um, you can see that we have really, really vague, like overarching umbrella distributive requirements. So we require, for example, um, two courses in the natural sciences. So if you're someone who is allergic to everything science, please don't panic because that does not mean that you have to take two courses in organic chemistry. I promise that's not the case. Um, Underneath every one of these large sort of overarching umbrellas, there are really hundreds of courses um, throughout your time at Dartmouth that will fulfill them. Um, and this is something that you kind of do at your own pace. And honestly, if you're a liberal arts college student, you probably like already exploring. So I think um, a lot of Dartmouth students probably already fulfill these sort of without even really trying to do so, just because they're already taking um, classes in different 
areas. So another really neat thing about Dartmouth that makes it really unique um, is not just the fact that we are on the quarter system, but also on the fact by the fact that we are sort of unique also in the context of the quarter system. And we call this the D plan. And this graph, this chart that you see in front of you looks really confusing. So I want to loop in one of our students, maybe Caroline, um, you're smiling, so I want to call on you to sort of explain the D plan um, to someone who is not at all familiar with it. Sure. So this chart is definitely the best way to explain the D plan, so I'm glad it's in front of me. But basically, in a nutshell, um, all students are required to be on campus the fall, winter, and spring. So like the normal school year um, of their first year and their senior year. And then you're also required to be on one other term, which is the summer after your sophomore year, which sounds scary, but trust me, super fun. Um, and most people think sophomore summer is like the best term um, of their Dartmouth experience. Um, and then that leaves um, basically one term in your sophomore or junior year, which you can pick um, to take off. And being off just means you're not taking classes on campus at Dartmouth. So the trimesters are 10, well, the terms, sorry, they're 10 weeks long. So basically you get 10 weeks to travel or do a job or do an internship, um, sort of like do this intense, like amazing experience that you wouldn't get any other way. I, um, I took my off term this winter and I went to Sydney, Australia and did research and laid on the beach a lot because it's summer in Australia when it's winter here, so yeah. Um, Nicole, I don't want to ignore you, so do you want to tell us about maybe a way that you've spent an off term? Sure, yeah. I've um, studied abroad in Dublin, Ireland, and then domestically in Los Angeles for English and film. Awesome. So those are just a couple of, of examples, but, um, you know, the, the thing about the D-Plan and you know, the quarter system in general, I think, really affords you so much flexibility. And you can see here you know, that you have so much choice that you wouldn't have under a normal, you know, semester block calendar. Um, so there are definitely, I think, some drawbacks to the quarter system, such as it's very fast paced, but it is really nice in that you have that flexibility. And something that, Nicole, I think you just mentioned is study away. Um, Dartmouth is actually pretty special in terms of study away because we have um, the highest percentage of students studying abroad within the Ivy League, and that is, I think, very much due to the D plan and the quarter system. So some statistics I could give you, 60% um, of students study abroad once, 30% um, study abroad twice, and 10% um, study abroad three times or even more than that. So it is possible to really get out there. Um, and these are just a couple of examples um, of very many that you could choose. So we have um, two specific types of programs. We have LSAs, which are language study abroad. So maybe you're studying like German in Germany or Moroccan Arabic in Morocco. Um, or we also have of FSPs, which are foreign study programs where you're studying a particular subject um, abroad. So maybe you're studying biology in Costa Rica or engineering in Bangkok, I think are two pretty popular programs. And as Nicole pointed out, we do also have some domestic options as well. So Los Angeles is here, not because we think it is abroad, um, but we do also have some study away um, available in the United States as well, if you would like to stay. Um, within our borders. But inevitably, you know, if you're in the 40% of students who don't study abroad, um, it is really crucial to point out that, you know, you will not miss out on, you know, a global experience. Um, as admissions officers, it is partially our job to make sure that our campus is pretty much representative, not just of our country, but of the entire world. Um, and a big part of this is, you know, the classes that you attend. And I foreshadowed this um, a little bit earlier that, you know, Dartmouth College prides itself on its size because, you know, we really do prize the student-faculty 
relations. Um, and pretty much every Dartmouth student has a story to tell about a particular professor um, or a certain class that they had. So I want to hear from you too um, to maybe talk about um, a certain class or a certain professor that um, really just highlights, you know, just how far that student to faculty um, relationship goes here at Dartmouth. So Nicole, I think you just spoke, so we'll give you a little break. Um, Caroline, how about we start with you? Sure. Um, I took a class last fall um, on Native American history, which is nice because it hit my major and my minor. Um, and the professor was incredible. He wrote the textbook that we used in the class. Um, he actually appeared in a documentary that my grandparents watched um, like while I was taking his class. They texted me, which they always do when they see Dartmouth in the news, which is really cute. And they asked me if I knew this professor, and I got to say, oh my gosh, I was just in his class. Um, so that was really incredible. I had a super great experience in his class, but I never actually talked to him one-on-one -on -one because it was a large lecture. Um, and this summer, I was bored looking for things to do in quarantine, and um, I texted, I sorry, emailed this professor and asked him what he was working on, um, if he had any work for me. It was a total shot in the dark. I, would, I was so surprised that he even remembered who I was. Um, he emailed me back later that day, hi, Caroline, I'm working on a book. Will you help me write it? Um, so I've been working on helping him write this book. Um, it's really interesting about George Washington's uh, interaction with Native Americans, and um, I've loved the work. It's really given my quarantine time some purpose. Um, this is such an interesting project. That sounds amazing, Caroline. I'm glad that you have a project to work on during self-isolation. <laughs> um, how about you, Nicole? I definitely can't top that. That's really cool. But um, I had an English professor my freshman spring um, who I loved. I loved. I loved her class. Um, and she reached out to me my sophomore year and asked if I had ever thought about doing research. And I said, no, <laughs> I hadn't thought about it. And she said, well, you should. And she said I should do whatever I was interested in and she would help me. So I ended up studying sexual violence in medieval literature. Um, which was so much fun, and she was an expert in medieval um, literature and Chaucer, um, which was an area of interest of mine, so I got to do research on that, which was really awesome. And yeah, professors are always super responsive to students, and even sometimes um, they push you and ask you to do things without you even asking them. Awesome. Thank you both for sharing a little bit. And like I said, every Dartmouth student ever, I think, has a story like this to share. Um, and these are just two of them. And of course, um, just as important are um, you know, the students that you're going to be living with. So student life. I think it would probably be fair to say, and Caroline or Nicole, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but student life is probably more concentrated on campus than it would be at most schools, especially compared to like a school in the city, um, just because of where we are and that manifests itself in many, many different ways. Um, and I wanna give you two an opportunity to talk about something that you've been involved with. Um, you can tell us about an activity or a club or anything that you think is relevant um, and how you got into um, getting involved with that. Caroline, how about we start with you? Sure. So I mentioned earlier that I'm a member of the Glee Club, which is unfortunately not like the show in that we don't dance because I can't dance. Um, but I was a pretty serious singer in high school. And so um, being part of a choir in college was something that I really wanted to do. Um, and I'm so glad I did. Um, we do so many cool things. We perform like classical works. But my favorite part of being in Glee Club is that we're sort of the stewards of the old Dartmouth songs. Um, so not only the alma mater, but there's also like a ton of songs that were written um, way, way back in Dartmouth's history. And um, we get to sing every year at the Homecoming Bonfire, which is my favorite Dartmouth tradition. Um, we get to do the alma mater, and it's so fun to see all the alums come back and just the amount of school pride um, that Dartmouth people have for their schools. So fun to see. So, yeah, it's super fun. Thanks for sharing, Caroline. How about you, Nicole? Yeah, so I um, got involved with theater my freshman year. 
I had never done it before and really wanted to try it out. Um, and I've been acting kind of through my whole Dartmouth experience, um, discovered like a whole new community, a whole bunch of new friends, um, something I probably never would have tried, but it's such a like tight knit and welcoming group of people here. Um, so it's been really fun. Thank you both for sharing. And something else I want to point out um, in this picture that you might see, like these different colored flags here. And that's also something that's important to point out about Dartmouth, um, is it's sort of new residential college system. And these are sort of the emblems of a couple of the um, residential colleges. So um, this, like I said, this is kind of a new system. So I think it's still getting sort of like <laughs> entrenched into Dartmouth culture. Um, but it is essentially, and I try to avoid saying this as much as I can, but it is like sort of a Harry Potter system. I know every school that has a residential college says that, um, but it is the best way to get across that idea. Um, so there are six of them. And essentially, before you get here as a freshman, you'll be like sorted into one of these six colleges that sort of have uncreative names that are maybe not as cool as like Slytherin or Gryffindor. Um, but it is the same idea and that will be essentially like your home base, your community for the four years that you are here at Dartmouth. So I didn't want to forget to mention that. And Caroline, you were talking about like traditions and like the bonfire, which we don't have a picture of here, but there's like a massive bonfire that they put on every fall um, during homecoming, which is really, really cool. You would think it would be dangerous, but nothing has happened yet. Um, but that's just one example of the traditions at Dartmouth. And, you know, that I think is one thing that I would really um, point out about Dartmouth is how deeply its traditions run. Um, and it goes year round. Like we were talking about in the beginning, campus doesn't shut down during winter. Not at all. Um, here you can see some just pictures of general winter frolicking, but we have, um, it's called Winter Carnival, where students will build like these really impressive snow and ice sculptures um, with, I don't know, like, do they have, do they not go to class or something? Because it honestly is really impressive what they can build. Um, and another tradition that is very much prized at Dartmouth and is at the center, I think, of the Dartmouth experience for a lot of people um, is called Freshman Trips, which is basically like a really, really amazing like freshman orientation trip. And it sounds kind of scary on the surface of it, but um, it's essentially like a group of undergraduates getting whisked away into the wilderness with a, with a pair of upperclassmen guides. Um, who are not paid, by the way, it's completely volunteer. Um, and they have like a sort of outdoorsy experience and bonding time over a few days. And I know a lot of best friends get made over trips. And it is something that a lot of Dartmouth students will just look on fondly throughout their time at Dartmouth. So I want to give you two a little bit of space to reflect on your trips experiences. Um, no trip, I think, is the same. So, Nicole, how about we start with you? Sure. So, I did meet my best friend on trips. Um, so, I'm a total Dartmouth cliche. Um, but I don't much care for the outdoors <laughs> as much as a lot of Dartmouth students do. So, trips was really pushing my boundaries for me. But um, I met a lot of really interesting people. And you definitely bond with people when you're camping in the in the woods um yeah and that kind of it really does set you up and that kind of community is something that you see at Dartmouth all throughout the four years there how about you Caroline yeah I also just think it's a really really unique way to start um your freshman year because um like most people I was absolutely terrified when my parents like dropped me on the green and I think a lot of people, like, when they envision sort of their parents departing college, it's like, 
that fear of like sitting alone in their dorm room with nothing to do and no one to do it with. And um, instead I like had this giant backpack on my back and it was full of like nothing cotton and all sorts of like hiking boots and, and camping stuff. Um, and I sort of like hefted it away and went and met people um, who were dancing on the green uh, to welcome us. <laughs> so it was definitely like such an incredible whirlwind way to start um, my experience. And I think Dartmouth does that so well, even when you get back from trips, like they keep you so busy. You don't have time to feel homesick or stressed. Like you're just constantly meeting new people and having incredible experiences. So for that, I'm super grateful to trips. Yeah. And I think Nicole, you sort of touched on an important point that like you weren't super outdoorsy. And I do think it's important to note that there's like a range of programs available for like super outdoorsy people to like people who are not so outdoorsy. So I think an appreciation for nature definitely goes a long way. Um, but you do not need to be like someone who likes to get like super down and dirty. <laughs> so thank you both for sharing a little bit about your trips experiences. And this is just a quick little fun slide. Um, it's, I think it's always fun to know some of the famous people who you might recognize who have gone to Dartmouth or whatever colleges it, it is that you're looking at. So um, just a few that you might note. I think everyone probably knows Mindy Kaling. She's probably like the first one that your eye goes to. Um, you know, if you watch like The Office or The Mindy Project, I think it's called, definitely seen her on TV. Um, more recently, you've probably seen Jake Tapper and Kirsten Gillibrand on TV. Um, Jake Tapper is a pretty famous anchor, and he moderated, I think it was his second debates, um, where Kirsten Gillibrand was also on that stage since she was um, running for president at the time. So Dartmouth was very well represented um, on that debate stage. And it's always fun, I think, to know, you know, what these people study. Like Mindy Kaling obviously knew what she was going for from the beginning, drama. Not all of us are like that. Um, Kirsten Gillibrand is maybe a little bit more of a head scratcher. You know, Asian studies may not seem, you know, necessarily connected to her job as um, senator, of, as a New York senator. Um, but that, you know, really goes to show you the power of the liberal arts, where, you know, you study one subject in school, and it teaches you more how to think rather than what to think, and you can sort of take it into any direction that you want. So, maybe you're motivated now to um, have your face on that slide of famous people in like 30, 20 years when you're old enough to. And for that to happen, we actually have to get you into Dartmouth. So um, I will go through this really, really quickly, but highlight um, sort of points I think that are important to know about Dartmouth. First is that um, the application that we use, we do only take the common application and the QuestBridge application. So we do not use the coalition application. Um, if you want to apply to Dartmouth, you will have to make a common application account. Um, as of this year, for this upcoming cycle, no surprise, you know, many people are not able to take an SAT or ACT, so testing is completely optional. Um, this goes for SAT, ACT, subject tests. People ask me a lot, does optional actually mean optional? Yes, I promise you that this isn't, we're not trying to trick you, this isn't an SAT question. Um, it is very much optional. Um, we understand that given the circumstances, many of you probably do not have the opportunity to take a standardized test, and it will be our job to assess your applications without that metric. Um, and, you know, we read holistically every single year, so this will be no different. We will read your application in context just as we always do, just without this one piece of information that we would usually have. But we can't, given this unusual year that we are all living through. So one other thing I think that is um, pretty unique to Dartmouth, I'm not really aware of any other school that does this, is our peer recommendation, which you can see in parentheses is strongly encouraged. 
So we definitely do like to see a peer recommendation, but this is exactly what it sounds like. So we define a peer as basically anyone who is within five years of your age. So hopefully they're closer to your age than not. If your best friend is like 12 years old, that would be really interesting. Um, I would hope that they can write you a particularly eloquent letter of recommendation coming from a 12 year old. But it is really just asking like your best friend, be it um, like a best friend from high school, or it could even be like a brother or a sister, um, write you a letter of recommendation. And you know, your teachers and your school counselors can tell us certain things about you, but often they don't really know you on such a deep level that your friends know you at. And so it's just a nice piece of information for us to have to sort of piece everything together um, from your essays and all those letters. You know, it is just another view of you as a person. So if you apply to Dartmouth, we do strongly encourage that. And finally, I do want to leave a time for just a couple questions. Um, but just a little blurb on financial aid. Um, you can see here that we do guarantee to meet 100% of demonstrated financial need. And what that looks like is an average scholarship of over $55,000, so not bad. Um, and we can guarantee full tuition um, for students from families with typical assets and incomes less than $100,000. Um, if you make above this, don't, please don't think that you don't get any financial aid at all. Um, it is on a sliding scale, and it is very much holistic, just in the way that our admissions process is holistic. So any circumstances that um, your family has, so if you have like other siblings that are dependent on um, your parents or other siblings in college, that's stuff that will be taken into account. So um, that just about wraps it up for the main section of um, our discussion. These are just um, some of our social channels where you can um, engage with us just a little bit more. And I will also put in a little plug for our virtual tours that we are hosting, um, where we are actually having students on campus um, take you around with, like they're holding a selfie stick. So you'll actually be able to engage with students um, over a virtual tour setting um, and actually see campus um, in a way that probably most closely approximates um, the in-person tour experience. So um, we have about four minutes left and I want to get at some of these questions. So ooh, I think this is a good one. So um, Caroline, maybe you can answer this question really quickly. How do you think the D plan affects the sense of community on campus? I think that the fact that you are on your entire freshman and senior year really solidifies the community in a way um, that's really meaningful so that when you are away, sometimes you are away at different times than your friends and you're studying abroad and you're off, you're off, you're doing your off term at different times during your sophomore and junior year. But it's really important to remember that the freshman experience, um, you guys, your class is together. Your sophomore summer, it's just your class on campus. So you guys are all together and you really get to bond with your class. And senior year, again, you guys are all together. So I think that though people come and go, um, you all end up together in the end. So I don't think that it undermines the community at all. Great answer, Caroline. I would very much agree. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. So I think this is a question that a lot of people have and sometimes are afraid to ask in person. So um, Molly asks, um, if you're part of Greek life, and how has that affected or contributed to your experience at Dartmouth? Um, maybe since you already, um, you just spoke, Caroline, maybe Nicole, you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I'm not involved in Greek life. Um, it's definitely a big part of the social scene on campus. But um, I mentioned I was involved in theater, so I have a lot of... Um, a lot of friends in a community through that and then I've made friends within my major and with other people um so definitely you're not going to be socially like left left with nothing um but there are lots of students who are involved I believe the statistics is 66 
96% of eligible students are affiliated. Um, and definitely everyone has um, their, their own experience. And kind of Greek life is um, what you make of it. Yeah, I think that's kind of an overarching theme. A lot of the time is, you know, it's sort of pick your own adventure at Dartmouth. You know, you can be affiliated or you can also not be. And there are, there's a substantial population of students who will also not be affiliated. Um, so thank you for talking about that a little bit, Nicole. And I think it would be nice to wrap this up with maybe why you two chose Dartmouth. Um, I know we don't have time to get to every single question as we had over 200 participants, so I'm sorry that we couldn't get to everything. Um, but Caroline, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Um, so I actually almost didn't apply to Dartmouth because it was the first school that I ever visited, and so I don't, didn't really remember a ton about it. Um, because once you visit a lot of colleges, as I'm sure you guys know, they, they blur together. Um, so I applied a bit on a whim, and then when I got in, I came to the Accepted Students Day, and I was just overwhelmed by the enthusiasm that Dartmouth students have for Dartmouth. Um, the school spirit is so palpable on campus during um, Accepted Students Weekends, um, and we would sort of walk across campus, and people would call out to us and, and say, come to Dartmouth, and they were all like wearing sundresses, even though it was only 50 degrees out and they were like tanning. And I found that a little weird and culty, but super cool. And I was like, oh my God, I want to be like them. And you would just walk past people and think, I just want to be exactly like them. They seem like they're having a the time of their life. So yeah, that's why I chose Dartmouth and that's how I feel um, when I'm here. Thank you for that honest answer, Caroline. <laughs> um, how about you, Nicole? I actually, Dartmouth was the first school I visited too, <laughs> and also the last, because I came back again um, to make sure, and um, I too was kind of just taken in as soon as I stepped onto campus by, like, the people and their passion and their willingness to kind of talk to me, a prospective student who they had no need to be talking to, um, and... Um, it's really a beautiful place, and you can tell that people are really enthusiastic about welcoming you there, um, which to me was really exciting. All right. I think that ends us on a really great note. Thank you both for joining us tonight um, and sharing a little bit about your Dartmouth experiences. I feel inspired myself and like I've learned a little bit, so thank you for sharing. Um, and thank you for going through the questions in the background. Topher, I see you've been working very hard. Um, if, if we didn't get to your question, um, please feel free to email us at reply at dartmouth.edu. And we monitor that pretty well. So we will get you a response, um, either from an admissions officer or a student, um, as soon as we possibly can. So. I think that just about wraps it up. And um, thank you all for joining us tonight and have a good rest of your evening.